cancer is obviously a, a big and complex topic, and I will try and do it justice in, in a short time. But I apologise in advance if this is pitched too high or too low for the slightly varied audience we have here tonight. So what is the challenge of cancer? Well, in, can in Australia each year, about 120,000 people are diagnosed with cancer. Um, most of this cancer occurs in people who are over the age of 60 years, and almost 50,000 people die each year of cancer. So this is actually a major public health problem, and it's one that if we don't address, will continue to be a, a burden on our society. If you live to the age of 85 now, one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer. But the news is not all bad and survival has actually steadily improved. So if you go back about 25 years, about 45% of people lived for five years after a diagnosis of cancer. This is all cancers across the board. The most recent figures, which are available for the period 2007 to 2011, that corresponding number is 67%. But despite that improvement, this remains uh, probably the number one killer, although my cardiovascular colleagues, if they lump enough diseases together, can probably just, uh, just top it. Um, the other really big issue that we have to confront as a society is that the number of cases in, is increasing. And I said that most of these cases occur in people over the age of 60. There are more people over the age of 60, and therefore there are more cases of cancer going to be diagnosed. It's going up by about 3,000 cases per year. Now, this is just for males, but if you look at the burden of illness, um, the yellow boxes there are cancer, the green boxes are injuries, and the orange boxes are cardiovascular disease. Other than in people in their, I guess, first three to four decades of life, cancer is the number one burden of illness um, for the next four decades. And for the decades where it's not the leading burden of illness, in fact, it is usually second. And this is true in females as well. So as a, as a society, this is something that costs us dearly. Obviously, at an individual level, it, it is something that, that is uh, difficult for people to deal with, difficult for families to deal with. But as a society, it is the cost. It, it brings with it the cost of lost productivity, loss of life, and enormous costs associated with diagnosing and treating the disease. But to really talk about this, I think we first need to understand what cancer is. And people often regard this as a single disease. That is not true. It really is a group of diseases that have some things in common, but actually have very many things that distinguish one type of cancer from another. And that's something that, in fact, we have really only begun to truly understand in the last couple of decades. It's a disease that is associated with genetic change. Usually this is something that's acquired, but occasionally it's inherited. So you may have heard of familial cancers, where a cancer gene is passed on from generation to generation. Uh, so the, the, the changes in genetics are fundamental to cancers. It's characterised by changes in cell growth, in cell differentiation, in cell death and cell motility. And each of those things is very, very important. Cells have to grow, that's how we grow. But when they lose the signal that tells them when to stop growing, or when they lose the ability to turn into mature cells, that is one of the things that creates cancer. When they become immortal, it's another thing that creates cancer. And when they are able to spread around the body, that's a, a third thing that creates that. One of the things that has become very obvious to us is that as a disease, cancer is not just about the cancer cell. It depends entirely on the surroundings within the body where it grows and the microenvironment. And understanding that has led to some treatments that, that have helped treat cancer. And probably the most important advance in the last few years has been the beginnings of the understanding of how cancer interacts with our own immune systems. This is something that probably allows cancers to grow in the first place, and as I hope to show you a little later on, is the real way in which I suspect we will tackle cancer in the years to come. 
Now, there's lots of different ways of looking at cancer. You can look at a macroscopic level, and, and each of these scans are scans of a person with cancer. This one up here is a, is a lung cancer in the bottom part of the right lung of someone. Down here, this is someone's liver, uh, which unfortunately contains within it a number of deposits of cancer, uh, which originated in their bowel. And this is a scan of someone with very, very advanced lung cancer that has spread widely through their body and affects many parts of that body. That's one way of looking. Another way is you can look microscopically, and these are all different cancers, uh, a couple of different types of lung cancer and a melanoma. And for many years, really, our focus has been on the two things I've just shown you, either looking at cancer at a macroscopic level and trying to understand where it has spread to, where it has come from, and how it got there, or looking at what I would regard as a microscopic level, but a level where you're looking at the structure of the cancer, and, you know, this got progressively more and more sophisticated, but nonetheless, looking at things that are basically structural things. The great revolution in the understanding of cancer commenced probably in the 1980s, maybe just a little bit earlier than that, and has gone on and is continuing to now. And the paper from which this diagram is taken was really the first attempt to bring together years of research and to try and identify at a molecular level what are the things that make a cancer a cancer. And whilst it might seem simple or obvious now, the change in thinking that this brought about is actually very, very important because it was the understandings that come from the six points on this diagram that have actually led to a whole lot of treatments that are now highly effective in controlling some forms of cancer. So I'll go through them just very briefly. Probably the one that's become the most important is the ability at a molecular level for cells to continue to send a signal to grow. So this is called sustaining proliferative signaling. Secondly is the flip side of that. That is the ability of cancers or the, the thing that causes the cancer turning off a signal that tells the cancer to stop growing. It's getting rid of growth suppression. The third molecular change is creating pathways that allow cells to invade and to metastasize. Metastasize or metastasis is the spread of cancer from one part of your body to another. And in fact, it is that process above all else that makes cancers dangerous and sadly, in most cancers, makes them fatal. Um, creating immortality. Uh, it would be great to live forever, uh, except it's not so great if you're a cancer cell because it does a lot of damage. But molecular changes that create immortality is another fundamental hallmark of cancer. Inducing the ability to grow their own blood vessels, creating their own nutrition is another one. And doing things that stop cell death. Cell death is actually uh, an integral part of us when we grow, uh, the reason we don't keep growing and growing and growing is that for every cell that divides, somewhere a cell dies. That's the reason why we stay in balance. In a cancer, it's different. The mechanisms that control cell death become corrupted, if you like, and as a result, this cancer can continue to grow. About 10 years after that original publication, uh, it was updated and it's clear that there are some other hallmarks of cancer that contribute to the formation of cancer and allow it to grow. And these include changing the way cells use energy and avoiding immune destruction. And I, I will come back to this one a little later because that actually has turned out to be the, the way in which we will, um, I think, begin to tackle this problem. And changes in genomic stability, the ability to continue mutations once they've started, and also ways of tum having tumour-promoting inflammation have also become quite important. Now, to understand why cancer is dangerous, we need to talk a little bit about the extent of cancers. And uh, again, I apologise to those people who this is second nature to. But the extent of a cancer is a key determinant of what happens to people. So cancers can be localised. And if we take a lung cancer example, you could have just a mass in the lung. 
They can be regional, so they can start in the lung and have spread to the local lymph glands nearby, or they can be distant, so something that starts in the lung and, let's say, for argument's sake, spreads to the liver. There's a formal process we use to categorise this extent of spread, and it's called staging. And this is an example of a, a staging sheet for lung cancer. You, you can't read all the little bits on it, but the bit you might be able to see is that there are four stages. That's four, three, two, one, and there's... Sorry, I can't even read it. One, two, three, four. Um, and each of these re uh, describe cancers that have spread further and further. The reason that's important is that, by and large, it's not cancers that are localised to the site where they start that do us the damage. It's the spread of cancers and the spread to other parts of the body that make them so dangerous. And one of the things that follows is that it has been, relatively speaking, easy to control cancers that are localised. It has been very difficult to control, for medicine to control cancers that are widespread or, in some cases, to stop cancers that begin localised from spreading. And that's the challenge that we have to face. So to put it into context, um, all these little curves are survival curves. And I'm going to show a number of survival curves tonight. Um, so just to tell you what they all mean, across the bottom on the x-axis typically is time. On the y-axis is the percentage of people that are alive. And in some cases, I'll be talking about the percentage of cancers that are controlled. So the lower the curve, the lower down it is, the worse it is. So what these curves show is survival for lung cancer based on how widespread the cancer was at diagnosis. The blue line up the top for stage 1A cancer shows the best outcomes for the people with the earliest cancers. Um, we don't cure them all, as you can see, although this is survival from all causes, so some of these people are dying from heart attacks and strokes and other things that they probably got from their smoking that gave them their lung cancer as well. Um, the most advanced cancers you can see in this, effectively nobody survives much beyond three or four years. Now, these are, these are for different cancers. In red, breast cancer, green, bowel cancer, blue, lung cancer. And these are survival figures for different time periods. So the far right end is now, uh, the far left end is about 25 years ago. And you can see two things uh, from this curve, or from this graph. The first is that survival has actually improved for all of these cancers over that period of time. And the second is there are vastly different outcomes for different kinds of cancers. And it's worth just asking the question why. Why is breast cancer um, able to be, uh, have five-year survival of 90%, whereas for lung cancer that number's 14%? The answer comes back to something I said before, and that is that most breast cancer actually comes to attention when it is localised and, relatively speaking, if you give the right treatments, easy to deal with. Most lung cancer comes to attention when it has already spread. In fact, more than half of all lung cancers come to our attention when it's widespread in the body. And so it also follows from this that if we really want to improve survival in diseases like lung cancer, and in colon cancer, which is sitting in the middle, we have got to find better ways of dealing with the cancers that have spread. By all means, we have to find them early, prevent them and treat them, but we do need to find better ways of treating widespread cancers. And so to improve cancer outcomes really will require us to do many, many things simultaneously. Some of these things have been done. I've got up the top cancer biology because from a research point of view, from an understanding point of view, this is the key. If we do not understand the biology of a disease, it is very, very difficult to come up with good ways of treating that disease. So cancer biology, to me, is the starting point of everything. Um, I don't know if there are any public health people here. There probably are. And they will, of course, tell you that, in fact, it's not cancer biology that, that by itself stops diseases. It's prevention and early detection. And those things are in incredibly important. But the reality for us is that in our current state of play, for most cancers, we can do lots of things to prevent them and we can do lots of things to detect them early, but we will still have cancers for many years 
that present with widespread disease that we will need to treat. And so finding good ways, and this is sort of up in this area, to treat them, whether it be with radiotherapy, with better surgery, or with what I would regard as systemic treatments, and I mean by that things that you either put in your mouth or you put in a vein, so things that go right through your system, will be key to improving cancer outcomes in the future. Um, of course, prevention is important, but as someone that spends their life giving uh, drugs to people, it's lots of fun to come up with good, good drugs and good ways of dealing with it. Um, but I don't want to underplay how important prevention is as a way of dealing with cancer. It is something that you mustn't forget because, for example, with lung cancer, if you don't stop people smoking, we will be dealing with this as an epidemic for years and years to come. So how have we gone about trying to treat cancers that are widespread? Well, I said earlier that cancer is a disease of cell growth, and, and this diagram shows that when you start with a single cancer cell, and that is where cancers start, it takes a while for it to double and grow and grow and grow. In fact, most of a cancer cell's lifetime, most of a cancer's lifetime has occurred before we are able to detect it. So by the time you get to a billion cells, you have about a cubic centimetre of cancer. That's the size of cancer that we are able to detect. Another three doublings and you end up with a mass of cells that we usually detect. It's then relatively short, another seven doublings, till there is death of the person that's got that cancer. And the problem that we've got is that anywhere from this first single cell all the way over here, cells can metastasize, they can spread. Now, because cancer was recognized as a disease of growth, the earliest attempts to treat it widespread in the body were all focused on trying to interfere with mechanisms of cell growth. And the very earliest descriptions of chemotherapy came in the 1940s. There's a whole interesting story behind it, and very, very briefly, the top left one there, nitrogen mustard, um, is the same mustard gas that was used or derived from the same mustard gas that was used in the First World War. There was a, a very interesting and somewhat embarrassing to the Allies uh, episode when the Germans bombed a boat in Bari in, in Western Italy, Eastern Italy. That boat was actually carrying mustard gas, which the Allies planned to use during the war. Um, a number of people died immediately, but not everybody. And for the people who did not die immediately, the doctors noticed something really quite interesting, and that was that these people began de developing infections, and the reason they did is they had no white blood cells. And they relatively rapidly realised that the mustard gas was a very powerful way of getting rid of white blood cells. And from there, relatively shortly after the war, so this is 1946, uh, this publication, um, attempts were made to treat leukaemias and lymphomas, which are both diseases of white blood cells, using mustard. And in fact, this was quite successful, and that's why this publication is there. At the same time, um, over um, a little um, down the road, actually, in Boston, um, there were attempts made to use another way of stopping cell growth, using a, a series of chemicals called antifolates. And that was found to also work. And that was the start of chemotherapy. And it was felt to be a very sensible way of treating cancer because, after all, cancer was a disease where cells grew too fast. And in some diseases, this was spectacularly successful. So this is the sort of survival curve you want to have. Um, this is testicular cancer that has spread widely, treated with one of two different types of chemotherapy. This is already quite old work. This is nearly 30 years ago. And you can see that between 80 and 90% of these people were cured of their disease. In fact, a modern version of this would have 95% plus of these people cured. So that idea that you could treat a rapidly growing disease by giving drugs that stopped cell growth seemed to work. But it doesn't work in everything. So this is the equivalent sort of curve for chemotherapy. Uh, and in fact, the dotted line is for people not having any treatment at all. And what you see uh, is that chemotherapy, as shown here, barely worked in lung cancer. Um, it did make a difference. It made people live a little bit longer. But clearly, simply targeting the growing proportion of cells 
was not a good way of controlling this disease. And as it turns out, it's not a particularly good way of controlling many other of the most common cancers. Some are better than this, some are worse than this, but overall, it's not a very, very effective way. There's another thing that's really important, and I probably should have mentioned it on this curve. You're cured when this curve is horizontal. So that's what that means. It means no more people are dying. Uh, and you'll notice on this one, even at the far end, this curve is continuing to go down. This is important, and when I come back to some of the newer treatments, you'll see the difference of where we're at to now. Um, this is, again, lung cancer, and this is four different kinds of chemotherapy. And what you can see here, and you, you probably can't tell which one is which, the reason you can't tell which one is which is they're all the same, basically. They overlap. And what it's saying is that it doesn't matter much how much you play around with the chemotherapy. If you've got something that's not particularly effective, um, playing around with something that's not particularly effective is still not very effective. And so clearly a different approach was needed. And we might skip over that. Now, the net result of this sort of approach to treatment, um, and again, I'm using a lung cancer example, but there are many others I could pick, is that treatment became pretty generic. So if you had lung cancer, and it was a type called non-small cell lung cancer, and you had metastatic disease, basically the choice was chemotherapy, and that's all we used to do, or nothing. The other thing I'll just point out here, because you'll see how different this is now, is in at this time, and this is really only five to 10 years ago, there were really just two types of lung cancer, what we called non-small cell and what we called small cell. Now, what changed? Well, the advent of what we call targeted therapies changed this. Now, what do I mean by targeted therapies? Well, let's go back to that diagram I, I showed you earlier, and this is the, the updated version of that hallmarks of cancer. And remember I said that the thing that was recognised in the 1980s and 1990s if there, is that there are certain characteristics that turn cancers into cancers. And the sort of the conceptual leap that was made at that time was that rather than targeting the machinery of cell growth, the things that make all cells grow, it would make more sense if we targeted the specific changes that make cancer cells into cancers. And that's precisely what began happening at that time. And every one of the examples arranged around this are examples that are either in clinical use today or in very advanced stages of being tested. So the first group of things that was recognised was all about cell signalling. Um, on the top half there is a picture of what we call a receptor tyrosine kinase. Big fancy word. Basically, this is a picture of the wall of a cell. This is the outside world. This is the inside of the cell. And the thing about this receptor tyrosine kinase, you can see it straddles the outside and the inside. The way it works is that you get signals, and this little on the bottom half, this little blue thing is a signal, that bind to this. And when it binds, another molecule just the same joins up. And these two molecules together get switched on. And when they're switched on, uh, as all these arrows show, they begin sending signals. The signals are very clever biochemical signals. They mostly have to do with adding phosphate, uh, phos phosphate molecules onto other proteins. But that is the way in which a cell communicates from the outside to the inside. And it turns out that there are a whole lot of these tyrosine kinases, and there's some other ones as well. And as it turns out, many of them are altered in cancer. And there are different ways in which they can be altered, and the slide, the details don't matter, but in general, they can be altered by there being too many of them, so there are more signals coming. They can be altered by being mutated, and that is the one that has become the most important and most interesting for us, where there's a change in the sequence of the receptor, and so it is always switched on. Even if there's no signal there to tell it to be switched on, it is switched on. And they can be altered by binding to other molecules uh, and creating a, a so-called fusion molecule with two, two bits to it, which is always switched on. And in fact, the earliest one of those is a thing called the Philadelphia chromosome, which is really critical in, in one particular form of leukaemia. We always knew that this was the join of two genes, 
more recently, it was understood that by bringing those two things together, you actually create a protein that is always turned on and always sending a signal to grow. So someone came up with the idea, if there are things that are telling this to grow, what would happen if you blocked it? Well, this is what happens. So the very first drug that was really used in this way was a drug called trastuzumab. It's better known as Herceptin. And in breast cancer, in metastatic breast cancer, when it was added to chemotherapy, it made a small but important difference in how long women lived. And you can see this is the chemotherapy alone group. This is the chemotherapy plus trastuzumab group. And you can see that the survival is moved across a little bit. But the results here were not as amazing as people who might have expected. And it turns out that the reason for that was that whilst, whilst the thing that this targeted, a protein called HER2, was important in the growth of cancers, it wasn't a mutation that actually drove the cancer. And the first drug that really produced some incredibly dramatic results was this one. So imatinib, uh, or Gleevec, is a drug that actually targets a number of different things. Uh, GIST stands for gastrointestinal stromal tumours. Uh, it's a particular type of cancer that effectively was untreatable. Um, all this black stuff is tumour down here. You can see it in cross-section. And in this scan, you can see this large mass. So after one month, it's gone. And this, when it happened, I can tell you, and this, we're now talking about 2000, 2001, was like magic. To see something that measured 10, 12 centimetres or more disappear in the course of a month uh, was, was like magic. And the reason this worked so well is that the abnormality this was targeting was the thing that made that cancer into a cancer. And this is the survival curve, and you can see that, that it is nice and flat and it behaves itself now. There's a twist to the story. If you go on long enough, these tumours become resistant and you have to find a different way to target them. Um, but I'll come back and talk a bit about resistance because it, it becomes a general theme in how these drugs work. So in the lung cancer world, at about the same time, the same thing was happening. Um, on the right-hand side are two scans. The top one is of one of my patients in, back in 2002. Every one of these little white dots is a bit of cancer in their lung. And over here is where that cancer probably started. This scan was done about a month later, a little more than a month later, and you can see they're all gone. And they're gone because the patient was, in this case, treated with gefitinib. Now, in fact, when we started using this drug, this did not happen all that often. I've shown you the best one. Um, it didn't happen all that often, but it did happen. And here's another example of the same sort of thing. It, it was like magic. You had people who could barely breathe, and a couple of weeks later, they were back normal. So again, all the white bits are abnormal, and two weeks later, they're all gone. So why did this happen? Um, and why didn't it happen in everybody? Well, interestingly, um, anybody here, and I know Bruce is one of them who's worked in Boston, will know that there are two sides to Boston. There's the Massachusetts general side in cancer, the Massachusetts general side, and the Dana Farber side. And at exactly the same time, in these two opposing camps, who are now the best of friends, I'm told, um, there were people working to try and understand it. And what they did is they identified those patients where these things worked so well and went and had a look at the genes uh, in their cancers. And what they identified was that the people in whom this worked well actually had a mutation. And this mutation wasn't just something that was sort of sitting there, it was a driver. If you, in an experiment, took that mutation away, the cancer went away. If you put that mutation into a normal cell, you turned it into a cancer cell. And suddenly, the understanding that there were mutations that could create cancers um, became a reality. And the corollary of that, that if you can block the action of those mutations, you might be able to treat a cancer, was the explanation for why we saw these incredibly dramatic responses. It led to something far more important, though, because it led to people starting to look for other mutations. And so, Remember I said that before about 
2010 or it's 2009 really. Before that, there were really only two types of lung cancer, non-small cell and small cell. Well, this is now a dissection of non-small cell. So we went from knowing one type of mutation to knowing two, to knowing about five or six, to knowing about 14. And in fact, I should have updated this because there's now another couple. And in fact, it turns out in this type of lung cancer that all but about 25% of patients have some sort of mutation that contributes to the growth and genesis of their cancer. And this has been repeated in other forms of lung cancer. It's been repeated in melanoma and in a variety of other diseases. And it's becoming clear that this is something that drives cancer. Now, what's the importance of it? Well, before we really understood driver mutations, uh, a study was done which actually just took people who we thought might have a mutation without actually measuring it or looking for it. And they were treated either with chemotherapy, which is this red box, or with one of the drugs I've been talking about. And this is the result. And what you see is a really funny survival curve where to start with the people in red are doing better and then they're doing worse. And to start with the people in blue, which is the gefitinib, the, the thing that targets mutation, doing worse than better. And people were really puzzled till the technology to look at these mutations became available. And in fact, the curve I've just shown is made up of two very different curves. If you've got a mutation, then it's much, much better to be treated with this drug called gefitinib. If you don't, it's much, much better to be treated with standard chemotherapy. And suddenly the idea that you had to match your treatment to the characteristics of the patient's tumour was born. And it mattered in lots of ways. So this is actually quality of life. So the, the higher the bar, the better. The black ones are patients treated with the mutation-specific drug. And if they've got a mutation, they do much better than the chemotherapy. On the other side is the reverse. So if you don't have a mutation, you don't want to be treated or you shouldn't be treated with a drug that targets a mutation. And this has now been repeated in other diseases. So uh, the top two are lung cancer examples. The bottom is a melanoma example. And in each case, if you have a mutation in your cancer, the outcome is better if you are treated with a drug that targets that mutation. Now, the problem with this, and I alluded to it a little earlier, is that cancers are pretty smart and they've figured out ways, once you block one of these mutations, to actually work their way around it. And there are a, a variety of different ways in which this can occur. But this one is probably the single most important one. Um, that is that the cancer develops a second mutation that in some way makes it resistant to the drug that is being used. And so a huge amount of effort has gone into us finding ways of getting around this. So this is just a little picture of the gene that I've been talking about up until now. The, in green at the bottom are the mutations that make it sensitive to these drugs. But there are some mutations shown in red at the top that actually make it resistant. And it turns out when you look at patients who were initially treated with a drug and where that drug stopped working, that about two thirds of the cause of that is they get another mutation. It's a thing that's called T790M. And so to get around this, you've got to develop new drugs that not only deal with that first mutation, but deal with the second one. And the good news is that that now exists. And this is very recent data. This is um, presented at meetings within the last eight weeks or so. This is what's called a waterfall plot. And each little line there is an individual patient and the scale on the left-hand side is how much of a change in the size of the tumour there was. So what you want for an effective drug is you want all these lines going downwards. And you can see this is in patients whose tumours have stopped responding to those initial drugs, giving them one of these new ones and showing that they once again respond. And the data is very early, but it looks like that that is once again sustained. And so just to put in perspective, what does this mean to a patient? It means that a disease that in 2009 had a life, an average life expectancy of 10 months with the best treatment we have had available then, currently has a life expectancy of somewhere between 24 and 36 months. And that is an enormous change in a very 
short period of time. It's made even more impressive by the fact that we don't really yet understand the optimal way to use these drugs. So you would expect, or I would expect, further improvement to come. And so what underpins this? Well, these are just two reports that you won't be able to read, but they are reports of gene sequences um, that we routinely get on our patients. These, these, again, happen to be lung cancer examples, but we do it for many diseases. Because knowing the genetic makeup of a cancer has now become a central part of being able to treat cancer properly. And that is something that is changing before our eyes. It's ch uh, and it's changing uh, our ability to look up what mutations mean. This is a website run by, um, by the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Centre in the United States, where there's a catalogue of every one of these mutations and a database of what this, what treatment might work. So some of these are very easy, some of them are very rare and you need to get this data together. This has been driven by a huge revolution in the way we are able to get information. So the slide I'm showing you shows the cost of identifying and obtaining genetic information. Moore's law, the little white line, is widely used as a comparison. That's the, the law about computing power and how computing power increases over time. And you can see that we've gone from something that 15 years ago would have cost $100 million to do to something that today costs about $1,000. So the reality is that we can sequence people's genes. It's not used clinically uh, if you're doing whole genomes yet, but we're not far off being able to do that. And that is driving the way in which we treat those diseases. Now, everything I've talked about up until now is actually happening now. We are now going to talk briefly about the cutting edge. And the cutting edge is all about immuno-oncology. And this is the thing, I think, that will create an even bigger change than the one we've been through in the last few years. So this was hailed as the... the um, the breakthrough of the year by science the year before last because the year before last was when the first clinical results became available showing what you could do with some of these drugs. And immunotherapy is not something that's particularly new. In one way or another, it's been around since the end of the 19th century. But finding ways to harness um, the immune system have actually been quite elusive. Uh, there were some things that worked in the 80s and 90s, but associated with dreadful side effects that really meant it wasn't able to be used. But in the last few years, it has been possible, largely through an understanding of the biology of the immune system, to find ways of using immune therapies. But why should immunotherapy work? Why is it an even an appealing idea? Well, the immune system is all about identifying um, antigens, or, or foreign proteins, and tumours should be very, very antigenic. The numbers of mutations that occur should give rise to things that our immune system recognises. For many years, we've known that some cancers just seem to go away, not very commonly, but it does happen, and we've always assumed that that is due to the action of the immune system. And understanding how that might happen um, has led to the way in which we've developed some of these treatments. Now, what this shows is the, the range of mutational load, so how many mutations there are in different sorts of cancers. And way down the left-hand side are a lot of the childhood cancers, which typically do not have too much in the way of mutations. Interestingly, they have been some of the most successful ones in terms of the way we've been able to treat them. At the far right-hand end are the things that are caused really by environmental carcinogens, melanoma, lung cancer, bladder cancer, the things where mutations get caused by external chemicals, and they have the highest mutational loads, and that's been the, the sort of the testing ground for some of these immunotherapy approaches. So the key bit of understanding that's led to um, this being able to be used clinically has been recognition that there are a range of proteins on the, on the immune cells, and this thing over on the right-hand side is the T cell, part of our immune system, and the left-hand side are the various things that interact with it. And some of these, and this one highlighted in red and this one, 
one is called CTLA4, the other one is called PD-1, are proteins that when they're activated, turn your immune system off or dampen it down. Now you might say, why do we want our immune systems dampened down? Well, in the real world, whenever our immune system gets activated to fight infections and so on, we need something to turn it off. If we don't, it will go on and on and on and actually cause us problems. So that's why these things exist at all. But very importantly, that system can actually be hijacked by cancers. And it can be hijacked in two different ways. The first is, and this blue thing is the T cell, and this here is, um, in this case, a tumour cell. The tumour cell can have a mutation or have some way of expressing the protein that turns your immune system off. And that can just be there all the time. So no sooner than your immune system recognises the cancer, there's a signal that comes to turn it off. The second way, in some ways, is even more dangerous to us, and that is that your immune system goes and recognises the cancer, begins fighting it, but then produces its own signals, just as it would if there was a bacterial infection, to tell it to calm down, um, it's done its job, it now needs to turn itself off. Both those mechanisms result in a failure of our immune system to eradicate tumours. But both represent, if you like, a chink in the armour if you can find a way to attack that. And in fact, we have found a way to attack that. It's with a group of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. There are three different targets that are used, either PD-1 or PD-L1, and that like a lock and a key, they're the same system. One's attacking the lock, the other one's attacking the key. Or CTLA-4. And what these drugs all have in common is they block signals that tell your immune system to, to calm down. So the first drug that was used was this drug called ipilimumab, and uh, it was used in melanoma. These are two survival curves. The upper curve in each case is ipilimumab, the lower curve in each case is either chemotherapy or a, or a placebo. And the reason this is important is that as opposed to the curves I've shown you before, and some of these go out a long way, that's out at four years there, these curves end up more or less flat as you get further and further out. The implication being that there are some patients that may be cured of their disease. And this is in people with widespread melanoma to start with. Now, I'll grant you that's not particularly impressive yet, but it does get a little bit better. Because when you use one of the PD-1 drugs, it's highly effective. So this is now in patients with untreated melanoma, with no mutation, so nothing that you can target in some other way. This is what happens with standard chemotherapy for those patients, which is miserable. And this is what happens with one of the anti-PD-1 drugs. And the, the real key here is that there are patients here who have treatment who may actually um, live not just a long time, but potentially uh, this curve will flatten out. Now, this is very, very early. Um, this work's only been published at the beginning of this year, but we know there's a little bit more follow-up than what's in this curve, and it looks like that curve is continuing on horizontally with patients being treated and potentially cured. It works in other diseases too. So this is someone with lung cancer and you can see a large mass there and you can see six weeks later um, that mass is nearly gone. So why is this so exciting? Well, this is for patients with lung cancer treated with that same drug I showed you before. And again, as you see this coming out, you can begin to see this levelling off. More importantly, if you look over on the right-hand side, each one of these lines is an individual patient. The bits in blue are while they are having treatment. The bits in yellow is when the treatment was stopped. So mostly when we stop treatment in patients with advanced cancer, the cancer grows again and comes back. But these are patients who have ongoing control of their disease, in some cases 12 or 18 months after the end of any treatment. And that is a quantum leap in the way we treat cancer. And it will be as we learn how to use this, a way I suspect we will treat this long into the future. So um, what does it mean in lung cancer? Well, this is 
very similar to the show, curve I showed you before. The blue one are patients being treated with uh, immunotherapy. The green are patients being treated with standard chemotherapy. And you can see quite big differences and the beginnings of a flattening out of the curve as you get out towards the end. And perhaps even more interestingly, these drugs are remarkably non-toxic. Um, and so what you see here are the proportions of patients who have any side effects. And grade three to five are the bad side effects. And you can see that, in fact, less than 1% of these patients are having significant side effects. One of the reasons that people are so excited about this is that it looks like it works in lots and lots of diseases. So the curves here are in melanoma, in kidney cancer, in two different sorts of lung cancer. This is in head and neck cancer, again, showing, despite everything else having failed, about half the patients having disease that's shrinking away. And perhaps the most impressive of all on the right-hand side here, this is in Hodgkin's disease, so it's a type, of bone, uh, a type of lymphatic cancer that has failed all treatments, including bone marrow transplants. Almost all of these patients had um, quite lasting control of their disease with this. Now, we're in the early days of this, and there's a lot of work to understand how best to use it, but it is something that is quite dramatic and quite different to what we've seen before. It's an area where there's huge amounts of research going on. So at present, there's nearly 350 studies of this one class of drug alone that are actively ongoing. And as you might imagine, with that being the case, the, the volume of data that are being, is being generated is actually mind-boggling. So the very last thing uh, I will mention is that it would be good if we could find a way of identifying who will benefit from this. And so a lot of work's been done to see if we can find a marker um, because one of the things you will have seen from what I've said before is matching the right treatment to the right patient. So this slide shows that you can measure um, a uh, protein on the cells uh, in increasing amount, and if you look at what happens to patients with that protein, and this is lung cancer, uh, the ones with the most amount of protein have the best outcomes, the ones with smaller amounts of protein have a slightly less good outcome, still better than what we would achieve with chemotherapy. Other things are being looked at because we think that the number of mutations is important. We have ways of measuring the number of mutations in a cancer. And in very early studies, it looks like if you measure the number of mutations, those cancers with lots of mutations have much better outcomes with this treatment than those that do not have lots of mutations. So this is something that we have to work on. Now, the reason it's important, and we're coming close to the end, is that there are ways of combining different immune therapies. Up the top is a group of patients whose tumours have lots of PDL1. That's the, what we think is the target for these drugs. And what you see in green is the traditional treatment, which is called ipilimumab. In blue, you see a drug called nivolumab. And in orange, you see the combination of the two. And what you see is if you have lots of the target, Nivolumab, which is this new drug I've been talking about, doesn't really matter whether you give it alone or if you give it in combination with ipilimumab. But if you take the patients where the target for nivolumab is not there, you see quite a different pattern. So this is ipilimumab alone. The blue one is nivolumab alone. But if you give both drugs together, you suddenly get uh, a further improvement. So being able to find the patients where you expect your drug to work is important and finding the ones where you expect it not to work is also important because you can start doing other things to try and improve it. And this is a range of different targets on T cells. The ones that are circled in red are all already in clinical trials, but I made this slide about six months ago and in fact there's now another couple of these where there are actual trials ongoing in Australia and elsewhere looking to see if we can now improve on how this is working. And this is the list of drugs that are currently being tested, uh, and it is staggering, um, for a field that effectively did not exist at all five years ago. So what's the summary? Well, cancer remains a major public health problem and will for, for quite a number of years. 
To control cancer, we need to do lots of things. We need ways of preventing it. We need ways of understanding it. We need ways of diagnosing it early. But to really improve the survival of the most advanced forms of cancer, we need drugs that work well in the right people. The way in which we approach this has evolved in the past decade or so from a very generic one-size-fits-all approach to something where we actually measure the target we want to hit and we use the right drug to hit that target. And I think that the next five years we'll see that supplanted by immune therapy approaches, which will, I think, for the first time actually give us the opportunity to cure some of the patients with the most advanced forms of cancer. And lastly, just in case in this audience, I'm sure there's nobody um, that smokes, please remember that you can't actually do better than stopping people smoking and actually preventing the disease in the first place. And with that, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions.